I'm going to quickly run you through a project uh, of ours that uh, we've been developing for the last five years. Um, before I dive into it, it's maybe good to give a little background uh, to um, uh, how this, uh, the context that actually this was conceived in. Um, about five or six years ago, Jeremy Rifkin, uh, the famous uh, American economist, developed uh, the next economy for the, the city of Rotterdam and The Hague, actually for the region. It's a regional strategy for um, transforming the, 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 the regional economy from a linear fossil economy to a circular re renewable economy. Um, and there are three pillars um, for this energy transition. Uh, the first is um, uh, the energy transition itself. The second is the circular economy. And the third is uh, Internet of Things and big data. And basically what Rifkin did was he worked with a number of companies and the local authorities to develop this strategy for, for the region. And he said that all of these three pillars, the energy transition, circular economy, and the Internet of Things, they also have to land in education. So that's in a way the fourth pillar that links through all the other pillars. Um, and like all good uh, projects, uh, the Dutch Windwheel was actually uh, conceived uh, in a bar. Um, I was talking to the director at the time of, um, let me just see why is, yeah, of Kinderdijk. Um, some of you might be foreign, but to most Dutch people, this is a very familiar image, Kinderdijk, uh, UNESCO heritage site. And he was busy at that time um, connecting Kinderdijk to the center of Rotterdam by boat. Um, so he's an expert in, in, in tourism. And we started talking about how uh, innovative architecture has uh, actually changed the tourist industry for the city of Rotterdam. In the, in the last 10 years, Rotterdam has, has skyrocketed as a, a tourist destination and architecture and innovation has a lot to do with this. And we were talking about the, the next economy and about tourism. And he said, you know, what Rotterdam needs is um, an attraction, a touristic attraction, something like the London Eye but combined with the windmill of the future. And of course, at that stage, we had had a, a couple of beers. So um, you can still hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we can still hear you. Uh, at that stage, we had had a couple of beers and uh, I thought it was a brilliant idea. So when I got to the office the next day, uh, we started thinking about it. Uh, what if we were to make a, a tourist attraction, something like the, the, the London Eye? Um, but we're to combine that with, uh, with the windmill, uh, windmill of the or wind generation, uh, the next generation windmill. Um, and if we were to do this, uh, then we'd be able to generate our own energy. So we could probably also combine it with program. Uh, why can't we live and work and recreate in a structure of this nature? And if we were to connect that to a top location in the city of Rotterdam, somewhere on the water where it's capturing uh, sun, uh, in potential, we have a, 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 a real game changer in touristic uh, attractions for the city of Rotterdam, but also for potentially cities around the world. So we took this idea and we um, developed a, a first conceptual sketch and we posted it on internet and it was amazing the response uh, we got. The Netherlands is known for its windmills. Around 1,200 of them, some dating back centuries ago, are continuing to stand across the country. Now the port city of Rotterdam is trying something new. It plans to introduce a high-tech windmill ship, Skyscraper. Find out more. A unique landmark. La patria dei mulini a vento potrebbe presto ospitare windmill. In land of windmills, it can be shown by the windmills about them. For their moulin avant, or near the future, they will be able to be for their own avant, windmills. An unprecedented attraction. The structure at 154 meters is projected to be circled by the UNE. A building that the wind in the Niederländischen Hafenstadt Rotterdam has used, itself without external input, with energy to supply. A sustainable icon. C'est un système d'énergie renouvelable mis à l'essai dans le port de Rotterdam. Où le stade de Rotterdam est un des moins importants stades pour contenir les premiers appartements. The Dutch Wind. This is not a building. 
So uh, it's not a building. Um, this got picked up all around the world. Um, it was published more than a thousand times in over a hundred countries. And what happened was we started to get uh, calls from uh, uh, high tech companies like uh, Siemens and Speed, uh, from universities, from developers from all over the world who were interested in the project. And, uh, and some of them were even so interested that they were saying, well, can we order one already? But obviously it was just a concept. So what we started to do was uh, collect a group of um, uh, companies, research institutes, and local authorities, um, and we developed an innovation foundation, the Dutch Windwheel Innovation Foundation. And what we did with the foundation is we started to look at available technologies because we had a timeline of 2025 for the Dutch Windwheel Rotterdam. Um, so if you want to have the building standing in 2025, and we know that we need three years to build and two years to design, uh, we've got to have available technologies. And we started to, together with the, the municipality of Rotterdam, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, uh, we, we landed a green deal. So we could start to do some work with these, these companies and research institutes to see which technologies are available um, uh, within the time frame for this project. So some of the technologies that we initially thought of, uh, for example, Evicon, which is a, an innovative wind uh, uh, technology, actually from the TU Delft, that fell off because the development time is just, uh, it's, 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 it's not going to be ready uh, for, for use in the, in the short term. Um, and we had to start looking for uh, alternative technologies. So what you could say is that it's a, it's a, it's a technology and an innovation driven process. And this had impact also on the design. So our original concept was two rings. The outer ring is a tourist attraction uh, with uh, 36 cabins. Um, and the inner ring is, is program, uh, uh, housing, uh, working space, uh, hotel, uh, recreation uh, facilities, commercial facilities in the ground floor. And uh, the inner ring and the, the hole in the middle generate energy. But with these available technologies and with working together with our engineers, we uh, reconfigured the building from two rings, two independent rings to one, uh, to one ring with one single hole in the middle. A smaller hole and a higher hole um, that has to do with uh, aerodynamics and turbulence and also uh, accelerating uh, wind speeds uh, and also optimizing the potential for solar uh, energy uh, because it's not only generating energy by wind it's also a vertical solar farm um, and then we started to look into the second pillar of the next economy which is circular economy and how can we build this building in a circular modular fashion um, so we came up with the idea to create two kind of um, towers, you could say, on the sides. There are 30 by 30 meters, um, which are um, extendable. So you could make a building from 100 to 120 to 180 meters high um, with the same elements. Uh, and only the top and the bottom are custom elements. Uh, so this gives us flexibility for different locations uh, around the world. Um, and this led us to the, the concept of uh, building as a service, um, which is basically uh, taking the idea of circular economy for the built environment to the next level. We're all familiar with the idea of uh, leasing a lift, for example, in a building. But when you start to think about uh, the whole building as a collection of services, um, uh, you have to start rethinking the way in which you design, but you also have to start thinking in way in which you make contracts with the builders and the suppliers of buildings. And that led to the building as a service concept. In an age of unprecedented innovation, as we move towards the circular and performance economy, we need to radically rethink the way we make buildings. We need to start thinking of buildings as a collection of services. This model is called building as a service. By separating the different layers of the building and breaking them down into components, each individual layer can be viewed as a collection of services. This modular building system combined with a flexible structure allows for function-free programming. This means that spaces are fully adaptable over time. And apartments can be converted into a hotel or office or even a school. In this type of building, providers remain owner of their innovation and are therefore tasked to keep them up to date or replace them when needed. The innovations are integrated as modules into the different layers of the building. 
The structure is constructed with modular, bio-based elements, made to maximum transportable sizes and assembled on site. The flexible floor concept makes it possible to integrate living plants and to adapt the installations and even change the position of the bathroom or kitchen to suit future needs. The facade, or smart skin, integrates state-of-the-art facade technologies to regulate privacy, air, temperature, and light, while simultaneously producing sustainable solar energy. It is composed out of internationally recognized standard modules, allowing for upgrades as technologies become more efficient. The interior is built out of modular elements on a 30 by 30 centimeter grid and assembled with dry connections. This enables disassembly and reuse of elements when the spaces change in function. The installations which regulate comfort are connected to the users through smart sensors, enabling spaces to adapt real-time to user needs without the use of commands. This predictive environment is managed by a system of systems, a central brain that enables the individual systems to communicate optimally. The building is a learning ecosystem that process information collected daily in order to optimize the user experience and the environmental performance of the structure. By closing a performance contract with the building providers, end users are guaranteed an evolving environment in which both the software and hardware are perpetually being upgraded. Because of this, the total cost of ownership can be drastically reduced. This also forces providers to design long-lasting solutions that can easily be replaced and get a second life. Unlike traditional buildings, this system continually evolves to meet the changing needs of its users, setting the new standard for innovative building. So um, that little capsule that you saw as part of the Dutch windmill, one of the modules, you could say it's almost a pixel of the, the windmill, we um, actually built. Uh, we built it in the zoo in Rotterdam, of all places, between the, the polar bears and the, uh, the bisons. Um, this is a little structure which has been uh, used as a hotel room and meeting room. Um, we built it with 33 of the innovation partners. And the, the title for the non-Dutch readers uh, says, in the, uh, in the future, we will live in a service contract. Uh, so basically, the whole idea behind this module mock-up in the, in, the, in, the, in the zoo is that all of the partners were forced to work together in a way um, and to find ways to overcome the challenges of the circular economy, looking at how their technologies interact, but also at the new kind of financing uh, service contracts that need to be uh, made between the end users and the owners of the buildings. Um, so it's been opened and uh, it's basically a, a small space with a, a smart uh, facade. I think there were nine companies working on the facade um, with integrated technologies. It's, uh, it has uh, sun tracking uh, solar panels. It has transparent solar panels, it has traditional solar panels, it also has dynamic uh, sunscreening. Um, and one of the aspects of this small structure uh, is that we also looked at the water system. So it has a circular water system for as, as far as possible. It's, uh, um, uh, it captures rainwater and it's, it harvests and recycles. Uh, the grey water, uh, the black water, we didn't manage to get connected to the system. In, in Holland, it's, uh, it's quite a, a challenge still to, 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 to uh, filter black water to drinking water quality in terms of regulations. In Germany, apparently, it's possible. Um, but we managed to integrate uh, this technology into the structure and also we managed to integrate green into the structure. So. The floor itself uh, has a, a, a winter garden with uh, integrated green where the plants are actually growing out of the floor. Um, if we look at the total energy concept, because I guess you guys are mostly interested in energy. Um, basically, what we say is that the, the Dutch windle is, uh, is, is a form of climate architecture. Um, when I was a student in South Africa, I was very much uh, inspired by uh, nature, um, architects in those extreme climates have to uh, design using climate 
It's a, it's, it's, it's a prerequisite, it's out of necessity, it's not a choice. And one of the, 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 the most beautiful examples there is the, the termite hill, which is a fantastic form of uh, uh, climate architecture where it's uh, naturally ventilated and passively cooled using the thickness of the, the, the skin of the termite hill. And all termite hills around the world are different in size because of this, but they all have the same constant internal temperature. So this idea of climate architecture derived in the 50s um, uh, actually as bioclimatic architecture. And what we said is, let's design a building and we base the form on optimal harvesting of sun and wind. So what you see is that the form of the building is, uh, it's faced towards the southwest to the prominent wind uh, direction. Um, the, the inclination of the facade is optimal to generate solar energy. So it's a vertical solar farm. And in the middle, we have uh, power nests, which I'll touch on later. Um, these are elements which generate wind energy. At the same time, um, we capture uh, rainwater, we have a filtration system, we, we, uh, we capture heat from uh, rheothermy, and we, have, uh, 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 we produce our own biogas from the organic wastes. One of the aspects for this uh, building uh, is the design of the facade. So we create what we call a smart skin. Uh, on the south facade, we have what, what you could say is a, a double facade. The outer facade is composed of uh, louvers. 50% uh, of them are solar louvers. The other 50% not, um, which creates a kind of in-between space in between the outer facade and the inner facade. And this is a, a climate zone. So yeah, you could call it a winter garden but it has an, uh, a fantastic temperature that you can use the whole year to, to passively cool and heat the building. And it also allows for natural ventilation, even if you're at 100 meter uh, height. Um, some of the technology that we include in this uh, smart skin are well sun uh, uh, trans translucent uh, solar panels. These are also uh, used in the, in the mock-up in, in Bladeor. And it will result in uh, fantastic spaces where you have green integrated into the structure, even uh, at 50 or 100 meters above ground, ground floor, um, which will, will lead to uh, apartments of this quality. So the uh, wind aspect, it's called the Dutch wind wheel. Initially, we had a, a based the design on the Evicon technology, but as I said, this is not going to be market ready in the near future and it doesn't generate as much as we had hoped. Uh, then we came across uh, Power Nest, which is a Dutch innovation uh, by Ivis Power. Uh, Power Nest is a, a concept that um, is used on existing buildings. Uh, basically, what uh, Ivis Power does is they take a, a solar roof, a flat roof, they lift it up one story, and then they plug in vertical axis windmills. Uh, and the whole facade of the Power Nest is, 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 is an open facade. Uh, with uh, louvers which are optimized to uh, increase wind speeds uh, through, the, through the structure. And the advantages of these uh, vertical axis windmills is that they generate uh, energy at high, high speeds. They don't have the vibration issues that large uh, uh, traditional windmills uh, have. And uh, apparently they're friendly for birds. Um, so this is the, the integrated power nest technology. And then one of the biggest challenges is once you're generating uh, uh, solar and wind energy, um, you're generating it often at peak moments, but that's not always the moments that you need it. So we started to look at storage and distribution systems for energy. Um, there's a Dutch company called EcoVat, EcoVet in English, um, which has developed uh, heat and cold storage, uh, seasonal heat and cold storage. Uh, so basically what they do is they use wind and sun energy to heat, uh, to create uh, uh, thermal energy. So they, they transform heat and sun energy using a heat pump uh, into thermal energy, which can be stored seasonally. Uh, and it uh, can be stored for up to 85 degrees. And uh, depending on the building use and programming, um, heat is, uh, is normally one of the, the biggest uh, energy demands that we have in our structures, especially if we're looking at hotels, wellness and, and housing. So with Ecofat, we uh, did some initial uh, 
uh, explorations in the energy patterns of the building. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, we basically have the ambition of uh, being 100% CO2 neutral and uh, using the solar and the wind uh, technology and the storage potential with uh, the program that we are projecting on this structure for a, hypo a hypothetical location in Rotterdam, we're sitting at about 74% of that ambition. Uh, that would be the 1.0 uh, version. And the whole idea behind the building as a service uh, concept is that, for example, the solar panels in the, in the uh, louvers, um, we have a service contract and a performance contract with the supplier of those panels. So at the point of uh, realization of the building, it will be 74% CO2 neutral. But after seven years, we will uh, exchange those first generation solar panels for the next generation and our energy uh, performance will improve. And as we do this with more of the components in the building, but in time, the building will change from, from uh, 74% to 100% to energy plus. So that's basically the idea that it's a, it's a learning and uh, evolving ecosystem. One of the aspects we want to integrate into the structure is uh, 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 an innovation center. So we're thinking of an innovation center that is focused on uh, the energy transition. It depends on the location of the building, but in Rotterdam, there is some demand for a program of this nature. And the idea would be in the ground floor of the building in the center of the building to have this innovation center um, where companies and institutions working on the energy transition can work together on, uh, on, on next generation uh, solutions. The building for Rotterdam is uh, about 100 meters high. Uh, the outer ring is the, uh, is the tourist attraction that uh, actually goes underground. You step in, you go underground and then it moves over the structure. Um, we're looking at a combination of commercial program, a hotel just underneath the opening of the, the building, housing, and in the upper floors, we have a panorama restaurant and touristic uh, uh, attraction. One of the challenges that we have with this structure is obviously accessibility, um, uh, round lifts or the lifts that move in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bend um, are not uh, everyday uh, kind of lifts. So we did some research into how to uh, access the upper levels of the building within this complex form. And we came up with uh, the, the, the Tissen Grips Multi. Uh, this is an innovative lift that they've developed that can move vertically and horizontally. And they also have a twin lift, uh, but this one is interesting because you can have multiple lifts in one lift shaft. And by uh, moving pro predominantly vertically, um, you can move uh, horizontally as well. You can shift your core. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is interesting um, because it means that we can um, keep our core in the center of the structure. We can shift the core in the upper levels and we can also uh, create a, a fire lift all the way to the tourist attraction right in the top of the building. Um, it all started with uh, the idea of a tourist attraction. Um, we're working together with a Dutch company in Schiedam, KCE. Uh, they develop um, cabins and tourist attractions all around the world. Uh, the idea is that we would have uh, uh, cabins that will move underground. So you'll step into the cabin, you'll move underground, and you'll go through a kind of augmented reality experience. And you'll pop up, uh, you'll uh, go up to the top, uh, having a view over the harbor of Rotterdam, get out in the top at the panoramic restaurant, maybe have a meal, and then come down on the other side with uh, the city views. <coughs> this um, technology is based on the idea of a rail system. So it's not like the London Eye where the whole tourist, the whole wheel is turning. Actually, the building is the structure and the touristic attraction, the cabins, they move on a rail system. So each individual cabin has its own motor, its own air conditioning, and uh, they move on a parallel rail system, which means that they are independently um, driven. Um, 
The idea is that it's uh, not only um, uh, building as a service, uh, it's not only building that performs in terms of uh, energy and technologies, it's also a, an attraction. So uh, it integrates a lot of augmented reality and uh, artificial intelligence. So when you uh, book a ticket in China to come to Holland, uh, when you book in your flight, they say, well, do you want to visit the Dutch Windmill in Rotterdam? And if you say yes, then you get a few questions like, for example, who are you traveling with? What's your favorite music? And what is your favorite uh, food? Uh, when you arrive to Holland, uh, because your telephone has arrived at Schiphol, you get an SMS from the building. The building uh, informs you which platform your train is waiting. When you arrive to Rotterdam, your Uber is waiting. It brings you to the building. <coughs> you enter the building and it knows that you're there because of your telephone, obviously. And as you move up the in the curved glass surfaces, we have an information layer which identifies uh, touristic objects in the horizon. Uh, you get in your own language information about those uh, structures, what you're seeing, so you can connect uh, the past to the future. Uh, suddenly your favorite music starts playing uh, because you uh, forgot that you filled that in uh, six months ago when you booked your ticket, um, which kind of gives you a, a nice feeling. We call this uh, orchestrated serendipity. And you get a message on the screen that your friends are in the sky bar drinking your favorite drink and ordering your favorite food. Um, obviously, uh, uh, privacy is a huge issue. So there are a lot of the research companies and companies we're working with are looking into the privacy issues. Um, and that's something that you should be able to choose independently. So your, your level of interaction with the structure is, is up to you. It's something you can determine yourself. So here a view of the, the Panorama restaurant. At the moment, <coughs> we're working on a, a couple of locations in Rotterdam. We're in communication with the, the, the local authorities about two possible locations. Um, and simultaneously, we're working on a project uh, in America and uh, currently starting up uh, something in the Middle East as well. So. Uh, Probably in the next uh, three to five years, uh, you'll be able to visit your first uh, Dutch wind wheel somewhere in the, in the world. I'd like to leave it at that. Um, are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Dizan. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And um, yeah, there are quite a bit of questions. I'm just gonna read them out. Um, yeah, just because of time and efficiency. So the first question was from Thomas which was, what is the status of the mock-up in Rotterdam? But I think that was answered uh, along the presentation. Unless you have anything to add to that. Yeah, basically, it's up and running and the, the, munici munici uh, the uh, Rotterdam uh, Zoo uh, mm -hmm. also has a huge uh, ambition to become more sustainable. They obviously, with Corona, they have huge financial problems. So sustainability is also one of their uh, spear pins. Um, and they're, they're using the Dutch wind wheel mock-up also as a meeting space for companies that can help them with their transition to a more sustainable zoo. And obviously energy is also one of the uh, a crucial aspects of that. Oh, well, nice. Um, yeah, thanks for that answer. Uh, the next question is from Pavan. And the question is, is the building expected to generate enough energy, wind and solar to self-sustain the energy usage of its components? Yeah, that's... The ambition. Uh, so um, basically it depends on the program and we, we have now an incredible chicken and egg problem because we don't have the location. We're looking mm -hmm. at two possible locations and depending on the location, the program will change um, the mix of programs. So the amount of houses as opposed to commercial as offices, uh, hotel, etc. And as you as you as energy uh, experts know, uh, each program has its own energy pattern. Um, so we try to get an energy pattern where the program um, comp complements itself. So housing and offices are a nice match, um, but uh, it's impossible to do the calculations until we know the exact program. So we've done it now with a hypothetical program um, and we came up with uh, about 74% CO2 neutral, but that's for the energy usage of the building itself. That's not looking at embodied energy in the construction or any of those aspects. 
Okay. Um, yeah, the next question is from Paul. Uh, he says, this sounds like a massive interdisciplinary project. How many experts did you consult and from what subject areas do they come from? Oh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, sure. Yeah, we, in our innovation platform, the foundation, the Dutch Wingo Foundation, we have about 34 different uh, companies and research institutes that are working with us. Um, we did a lot of work with Alf Arup, uh, which is also a multidisciplinary uh, company. Um, but it's, 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 it's immense. And because we're integrating uh, attraction, hotel, uh, panoramic restaurants, commercial, the programmatic mix is, uh, makes it very, very uh, complicated. And also the ambition um, in terms of building as a service also makes it quite complicated because we're just in the beginning. It's pioneer work at the moment. There's, uh, we know that this is the direction buildings are going, but we don't have that many examples uh, mm -hmm. to follow yet. So we're using also as a kind of a catalyst. And so a lot of companies are also um, on board because they can use it as a, as a way to um, create some kind of uh, growth in their own company. Mm -hmm. and maybe a question that comes from that one from me. Um, did you have to change any design concepts of the building because of the technologies that you had to incorporate after you consulted with yeah. the experts? Absolutely. Actually, I mean, the, the building, it's a bit of a weird process because we normally as architects, we have a client who says, you know, these are the specifications, this is the budget, uh, this is the location, make a design. Mm -hmm. And here we turned it around. Uh, we had a crazy idea in a bar. Uh, we decided to take it one step further we got unprecedented exposure and positive response from the global community, which uh, gave us the platform to develop the concept. And then based on the available technologies, you see the design of the building evolving. Mm -hmm. And um, basically what we did was we uh, protected the intellectual property in a part in a separate uh, BV. And um, the companies that are working with us in other countries, they buy a license to uh, be able to, to build it. Then everything that, they, that we generate in those new projects goes back into the intellectual property. So actually it's an evolving concept, um, but it's become the idea is that it's replicable. And in each location, uh, it will adapt more to the local climatic conditions. So mm -hmm. in some places, uh, cooling is a major, uh, issue and solar energy is more uh, prominent in other places it's the opposite so it will have its kind of changes according to uh, specific uh, places and cultures okay um, and the next question is from uh, Nander he's asking what is the percentage chance that this building will actually be built uh, at the moment uh, it is about 90 percent we're busy 90%. Yeah, we're very close to um, the start of the, the, the pre-development phase in America. Mm -hmm. So the first one will be built uh, in America. And uh, yeah, once the first one's been built, then we expect that uh, the others will follow. And we have a kind of ambition. It would be really nice if we could build one in every continent. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so this is a more of a comment than a question. It's amazing concept. We all need to put hands and brain together, get it financed and move forward. Congrats. The Thank next you. question is uh, from Diana, and she's asking which company slash technology is dealing with the part of the building that converts organic waste to biomass, biogas? At the moment, there's no company connected to that part specifically. We in mm -hmm. Rotterdam, in our innovation foundation, we were working with Evidus and TNO, but that was more kind of as research uh, institutes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as we move to a final concept and to a location, then we'll, we'll find the specific companies that will get onto board for the individual uh, as suppliers for those services. Um, and then the next one is from uh, BU Row Nord 2. Um, he, they're asking, will it be possible to apply some of the mechanisms of a building to smaller projects with lower funds? Absolutely. That's the whole idea. So basically all of the technologies that we're using are uh, scalable. And mm -hmm. um, the smart skin, for example, is already being developed as a service for other projects, for an office project in, in the Netherlands. So. Um, 
And the idea is uh, absolutely that it's transferable information and knowledge. And basically, we just want to bring it together in this form uh, to accelerate some of these innovations. Okay. And w okay. Um, I yeah, hope that answered the question. The uh, next uh, question is from Jatinder Goyal. And his question is, uh, what exactly is the mechanism to generate wind energy in the building as I cannot see conventional wind turbines or vertical wind turbines being integrated into the building? Yeah, maybe he joined a little bit late, but I think that was already covered um, in the presentation. Yeah, that's basically the power nest technology. Those are in the horizontal bars. And in each bar, we have seven windmills. Um, so that's about uh, 35 windmills in, in total. And it's actually, it, it generates, I mean, it's not the predominantly uh, generator of energy for the structure. The, the solar energy actually generates a lot more, about three times as much, uh, four times as much as the, as the wind. Uh, but uh, in our idea, it's, it's interesting to start to look at integrated technologies for buildings. So we were adamant that we wanted to integrate sun and wind in, uh, in the structure. Uh, I'm going to go a bit uh, faster now because there there's a couple more questions. Um, this is from Daria Zendri. She, um, they're asking, this project fits the landscape of Rotterdam. Do you think it would also be accepted for other less futuristic and more historical cities? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, we've been approached by, I think, probably 20 cities around the world uh, that are interested in, in, in one of these. And those are cities that range um, uh, range in scale, but most of them, you're quite correct, most of them are quite uh, modern cities. Um, so I think it's something that does fit more into a modern landscape. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that is evident is also the form of the building. It's quite a, um, a standalone structure, so it needs some space around it. You could put it in, I wouldn't put it in downtown Manhattan, let's put it that way. I would rather put it on in Brooklyn across the water where you can see it from Manhattan and where there's enough space around it uh, so that it has also its kind of iconic, uh, the iconic form really comes to, 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 to the front. Uh, which, which cities uh, have you been approached or which cities are <laughs> most likely to be? Been... From uh, Las Vegas to San Francisco to Beijing to uh, Macau. Um, mm -hmm a number of cities in the Middle East as well. There's, there's a lot of interest, but basically this, the, we need to get the building, the first one built, and mm -hmm. then we prototype. And once you've got your prototype, then you can look at, uh, you know, at uh, doing it a second time. And each time the idea would be to do it better. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the next question is from Ishmael Lag Lagmiri. Um, and the question is, will the materials used for the building be collected in material passports? Yes, uh, part of the, the whole idea of building as a service is that the service providers and the providers of materials remain owner for as far as possible. Um, so we, we look at the potential of, for example, building with uh, dry connections, looking at uh, to build with as many homogenous materials as possible. Uh, in elements uh, and a material passport is, a, is, a, is an absolutely necessary part of the puzzle to make the building as a service concept work. Okay, um, the, there's two more questions and if uh, anyone else thinks of any other questions they can also possibly unmute themselves. We have about five minutes left so yeah. I'll just read three more questions from Paul George. Is it possible to have modular construction where after completed and being used, you can add more space? Um, no, the structure is actually, it's quite fixed in form. Uh, mm -hmm. because it's also, it's based on harvesting energy, um, but it is flexible in terms of where you place your interior walls. So we have what we call flexible floors and the position uh, of the walls is flexible. So you could uh, change your functions uh, per floor. Um, mm -hmm. It's flexible and adaptable, but um, to add onto the structure would be quite problematic because you, you change the, the, uh, the structural engineering of the, of the building. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's obviously quite a complicated structure in terms of form and also handling the, the wind loads. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't advise hanging boxes or anything onto the facade. Uh, I think once we've got the, the structure 
calculated rule. We'll stick to that. So, so the inside is malleable, but the outside structure is um, defined. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Vishwamber. And the question is, what is the estimated budget and payback time for this project? Well, I'm afraid I can't. Okay. It's quite, it, the, it's quite different in the, each location. Mm -hmm. So uh, the project in America is just to give you a ballpark feeling. It's twice as big as the project in Holland. Oh. Um, and uh, but it's not twice as big in height. So it depends very much on, on the location and the size of the structure. And a question from M. Emil. Um, are the Nether is the Netherlands the first country where the pilot project started, pilot build started? Uh, well, the Netherlands is the country where we started with the concept, but the first project will be built in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Naga Gutham. Are there any opportunities to be a part of this project? Uh, there are opportunities for uh, research institutes and for uh, companies that are interested in being part of the Dutch Wind Wheel Innovation Foundation. Um, there are companies, there are new companies connecting uh, every year to the foundation uh, and they're researching certain aspects, certain projects, uh, uh, technologies. So there are op options uh, to, mm -hmm. to and our idea is to create this potential in every new country, in every new project that we do. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Also creating jobs for researchers, yeah. Um, and another one is from Orestes. Um, extra energy will be stored as thermal energy. Will that be converted again to electrical energy using a steam engine? Yeah, the, the, the ECOVET technology, uh, basically it, it, it converts electrical energy into thermal. Mm -hmm. um, Predominantly, we will have a thermal demand in the building, so that's quite handy. And what they do is they, um, when there's a peak energy uh, delivery, let's say, uh, also using offshore wind, they buy mm -hmm. the energy in at a low price and then um, convert it uh, at a higher price for the moments when it's, uh, it's needed. So that means that there's potential to create an energy service corporation also for the people living in the building they can become part of the energy service corporation and be part of the business case for the energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, thanks for answering all these questions. I think that's it for uh, the questions. Those great answers. Um, and then here I have a last uh, comments from Euro Nord 2 from Lisette. She says, great concept, looking forward to seeing it come to life. I like that it matches the looks from the Mark Tall in some ways. Thanks for the talk and good luck with everything. Best regards, Lucette. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, 1 30, and yeah, thanks, Dizan, for giving the talk. It was really interesting. I really enjoyed that, and I uh, hope everyone enjoyed. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if you guys have any questions, you can email me at uh, info at All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Dizan. Bye. Bye.